Well, so a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely Saturday. Thank you very much for taking time to join us this morning. Welcome to the Time of Your Life Celebration 2022, jointly organized by the National Library Board and the Singapore University of Social Sciences. My name is Lester Leo. Very happy to be the MC for this very wonderful event today. So the title of today's keynote is Improving Aged Care for the Community. In today's session, you will discover the interconnected structures and resources that will go into creating an ecosystem for quality aged care. So firstly, to ensure that everyone enjoys a seamless experience, now do note the chat function, microphone, and video functions have been disabled. However, we will, do, we will be having a Q&A segment later on, so you can click on the Q&A icon, either on the top or the bottom of your screen, to pose your questions. In fact, you can do them right now. Now, you can also click on like to vote for questions that might interest you and our moderator can choose to pick on uh, your question later on. So to start off today's TOYL Celebration 2022, uh, all of you will be hearing from our distinguished speakers as they address the community's role in supporting the needs of aging persons by complementing technology with the right care framework and support systems within the community, we can significantly improve their quality of life. We'll first begin with the welcome address by CEO of NLB, Mr. Ng Chua Pong, and President of SUSS, Professor Chong Hee Kiet. Now, this will be followed by an opening speech by Senior Minister of State for Communications and Information and National Development, Mr. Tan Kiet Hao. We'll be then having a keynote presentation by Professor Ian Philp, followed by a short break. After the break, we'll continue with a sharing session by Dr. Ng Wai Chong, and after which the Q&A segment, which will be moderated by Associate Professor Carol Ma. So once again, I want to remind all our guests to please submit your questions via the Q&A icon. Now, after which, Associate Professor Ma will be sharing with us a bit more about the gerontology program. And last but not least, we'll be having Pearly, an NLB librarian, to share with us more about the NLB resources. So we hope that this online webinar will help us celebrate time of your life by diving to facets of aging like caregiving and lifelong learning as well as physical and mental well-being. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite the CEO of NLB, Mr. Ng Chopong, Pong, to give us his welcome address. Welcome, Mr. Ng. Thank you, Lester. Uh, Mr. Tan Kiet Hao, Senior Minister of State for Communications and Information and National Development. Uh, Professor Chong Hee Kiet, uh, President of SUSS. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and a very warm welcome to the Time of Your Life Celebration 2022. Uh, NLB is very happy to be able to collaborate once again with the Singapore University of uh, Social Sciences, or SUSS, to bring this event to you. We share a common purpose in wanting to provide ample opportunities for seniors to continue learning and thriving. One library patron who has benefited from this is Ms. Tan Yen Kim, a former enterprise and IT consultant, who I believe is also with us today. Uh, Ms. Tan has always been curious about 3D printing, ways to age actively and healthily, as well as how she can contribute to Singapore's green efforts. Uh, so she has fairly wide interests. Uh, however, work and family commitments in the past kept her from pursuing her interests. When she found out about the digital wellness and sustainability programs that NLB offers in person and digitally, she signed up for them. The programs were free and the digital ones could be accessed from the comfort of her home. Ms. Tan has been continuing to discover the range of resources and programs that we have. And I invited those of you who have not already done so to also check out the many programs we have on our LearnX website. Like Ms. Tan, many seniors appreciate the extra time available to pursue their interests. In taking up such pursuits, we make connections on several levels. First, we stay connected to the learning ecosystem that will keep us mentally active. Second, we discover connections, connections to communities where like-minded peers are around to exchange ideas on topics we're curious about. Last but not least, we also connect into the future with new skills and knowledge that we discover. So this year's theme of connections is uh, therefore very apt. Uh, you will find a rich array of programs throughout the month of October. For instance, uh, you can check out a Tech Bazaar, which will have talks, workshops, and a showcase on the latest technology that you can learn about and consider trying out in your daily lives. We also have Thinker Plus Play, the great Singapore trivia, which will help you connect with the past. 
Through the exciting quiz and learning from fellow participants, you will be able to enhance your understanding and appreciation for Singapore's heritage and identity. The Time of Your Life series of programs is a signature initiative under Lab 25 or the Libraries and Archives Blueprint 2025, where we want to provide lifelong learning opportunities for seniors. Uh, since last October, when Lab 25 was launched, we have organized more than 4,300 programs for seniors uh, in areas such as digital, wellness, arts, sustainability, and reading, uh, and they collectively attracted more than 34,000 participants. The feedback has been encouraging, and we look forward to doing more such programs. We also welcome your suggestions on programs we can organize for you, uh, just like how we managed to offer Ms. Tan something to take on. In closing, I would like to take this opportunity to thank SMS Tan for taking the time this morning uh, to grace our opening ceremony. Uh, I would also like to thank SUSS and the various program partners for joining us to contribute your knowledge and efforts to make this event uh, possible. I wish you all the time of your life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ng Shapong, for the welcome address. And I'd like to invite President of SUSS, Professor Chong Hee Kiet, to give us his welcome address. Professor, please. Uh, Mr. Tan Kiet Hao, Senior Minister of State uh, com for Communications and Information and uh, for National Development. Uh, Mr. Ng Chok Pong, Chief Executive Officer, National Library Board or NLB, guests and friends from the industry and ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all of you. I am pleased to welcome you to the seventh edition of Time of Your Life Celebration, jointly organized by the Singapore University of Social Sciences or SUSS and the National Library Board, NLB, to celebrate our senior adults. And this is held today in tandem with the International Day of Older Persons. The theme for this year's celebration is connections are important in linking the communities and strengthening the social bonding to be more interconnected. And besides what um, CE uh, uh, Chepong has mentioned about what that connectivity is all about and connections, the theme also emphasizes the desirability and benefits of various parties, the government, the industry, uh, innovators, social groups, the young, and even the old themselves to come together, connecting with one another to bring good to the elderly, connecting the elderly themselves through activities, through the use of technology, fostering relationships and interactions between the elderly and the rest of the population, building understanding of the needs and aspirations of the elderly so that they can be better served. In fact, as we connect, we are actually building an ecosystem. And as we connect, we are then able to deal holistically with the issues that the aged face. We get different perspectives coming in as we talk to one another and look at the issues together. And we see a variety of activities being conducted towards this end. One involves SUSS collaboration with NLB, which has been sustained for several years and continues to bear fruit and uh, impacting the community for greater good. Besides curating a series of interesting online and on-site programs in public libraries across Singapore throughout the month of October. This year, we have several experts to share their insights on an increasingly important topic. And that is how new and evolving care, how the new and evolving care framework and support systems will have to be well complemented by technology seamlessly. Technology is a, is a key feature in the lives of our elderly and enriching and enabling. But as evident in the pandemic, technology can also be bewildering to our seniors. And the fact is that they will continue to be confronted with rapid technological um, disruptions. So there is a pressing need for us to further advance our knowledge and understanding of digital technologies and their potential 
to provide social and emotional enrichment for our aged care framework and deployment. Uh, still on technology, SUSS and our technology partners will participate in the Tech Bazaar at Topayo NLB on the 29th and 30th October 2022 to showcase how assistive technologies can help older persons and their caregivers. SUSS and NLB organized a similar exhibition in May last year, and it was well received by the older adults and also their grandchildren. Many of them took selfies with the social robots, Lobot and Paro, both designed to improve the quality of lives of patients with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and other cognition disorders. This time, we will be exhibiting additional new technology and devices for the older persons and their caregivers. Then, besides technology, there's the learning to be done to bring awareness of various matters related to seniors. The useful talks and seminars on topics such as dysphagia, sleep disorders, self-care, building communities, evolving banking trends, and managing emergencies at home will be presented in this month-long learning festival. I myself am, am bewildered by the banking trends that are taking place and I have to cope myself and maybe I should attend some of the seminars as well. <laughs> for its part, you know, SUSS has been pushing the agenda for active living for the elderly and tangible care and support for them. As part of our CSR activities with corporates, the gerontology team also worked with Southwest CDC and Toshiba to donate 15 washing machines and other electrical appliances to three nursing homes and one elder care center. SUSS gerontology faculty members, students, and alumni actively contribute and participate in community work to serve the silver population. I'm heartened that SUSS recently received the Community Spirit Merit Award from the People's Association in recognition of our work with older persons during the pandemic. And away from Singapore, SUSS was, was involved in the Age Well Japan seminar to stream sessions from Shibuya QWS, a scramble society which gathers groups regardless of age or specialty in Japan that creates value for the community. The purpose is to have our Singapore audience learn topics about aging well with innovative ideas in super aging Japan. You know, it takes minds, hands and hearts to come together to help the elderly live well, meaningfully and with dignity. Today, all of you have assembled to share, learn, network, and collaborate for the betterment of the older persons in the community. I hope that even as you do that coming together, you will benefit personally and beat a stronger heart for the seniors. Finally, let me thank the organizing team for working very hard to bring this month-long activity to us and, your, and for your attendance uh, with us. And I, I, I believe your attendance will surely give them, uh, the organizers, much joy and satisfaction in doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chong, for the welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, we now hear from Senior Minister of State for Communications and Information and National Development, Mr. Tan Kiet Hao. SMS, please. Mr. Ng Pong, Chief Executive Officer, National Library Board, Professor Chong Hee Kiet, President at SUSS, Professor Yen Philip, Founder of Age Care Technologies, Dr. Ng Wai Chong, Founder and Chief Executive Officer for NYC Longevity Practice, Associate Professor Karama, SUSS. Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to all of you. I'm very happy to join all of you today for this year's Time of Your Life celebration. As also mentioned by uh, Mr. Ng Chu Pong and uh, Professor uh, 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 Cheong, uh, this is a month-long event to celebrate seniors 
and we are launching it today on 1st October, coinciding with the International Day of Older Persons. I'd like to commend the, this collaboration between the National Library Board and SUSS. It's a very meaningful one. As we know, Singapore's population is rapidly aging. By 2030, end of this decade, about one in four Singapore residents will be at least 65 years old. So we must work together to build an inclusive society where our seniors can live and age well. And the government takes a whole society approach and is committed to help Singaporeans age more confidently and gracefully. In 2015, the Ministerial Committee on Aging, or MCA, launched the first action plan for successful aging to achieve this outcome. This first plan included more than 70 initiatives covering a total of, uh, covering a total of 12 areas spanning across health and wellness, employment, and transport. Seven years on, in 2022, the MCA is now looking at refreshing the action plan to address the evolving needs and aspirations of our current and future seniors. Refresh action plan will complement the broader Healthier SG strategy that was recently unveiled by the Ministry of Health. This will help us take charge of our health and it focuses on three C's to empower Singaporeans to age well. First C is care. Care aims to empower seniors to take care of their physical and mental well-being so that they can pursue their aspirations through healthy longevity. The second C is contribution. Contribution aims to enable seniors to continue to contribute their knowledge and expertise to society even as they age. And the third C, last but not least, connectedness aims to support seniors to age in place and remain connected to their loved ones and the broader community. And this is very much related to the theme of this year's Time of Your Life celebration, which is connections. As also mentioned by Professor Chong, the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified social issues, such as the isolation of seniors and increased stress on their caregivers. This was especially so during the period of heightened measures like the circuit, break, uh, like the circuit breaker period in 2020. Mental health experts have said that social distancing need not equate to social isolation, and I fully agree. We may be physically distant, but can still stay connected with friends, family, and the broader community. To that end, the time of our life celebrations focus on the importance of connections is correct and important. We want to encourage seniors to connect not only with their past and present, but also with the wider community, those in the neighborhoods, friends and family, and connect into the future with improved digital literacy. At the Ministry of Communication and Information, we want to leverage digital technologies to help all Singaporeans, including our seniors, live more engaged and enriched lives. For instance, seniors who are digitally engaged will find it easier to keep in touch with friends and family and stay connected in our increasingly digital society. Having the relevant knowledge and skills will also bring about greater ease and convenience to our seniors in completing their daily tasks, such as ordering groceries online or making health appointments digitally. That's why we launched Seniors Go Digital Program to help seniors pick up digital skills that add convenience to their day-to-day -day lives. HD Digital Community Hubs were set up at community clubs and centers, as well as selected public libraries, where our friendly digital ambassadors are available to provide one-on-one -on -one guidance to seniors to equip them with digital skills and tools. Our seniors are also taught about cybersecurity risk and tips, importantly, how they can keep themselves safe online. This complements the SG CyberSafe Seniors Program launched by the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore last year in 2021, which aims to raise awareness and encourage seniors to cyber hygiene practices. 
and the government cannot do this alone. We need to harness the expertise of partners from the people and private sector to allow all Singaporeans to fully reap the benefits of technology. The month-long time of your life celebration event illustrates this well. Through the partnership, NLB is able to connect its community of leaders with SUSS academic expertise in gerontology to promote active engagement and collective sharing on aging issues. And such community partnerships further support NLB's Lab 25 or Libraries and Archives Blueprint 2025 Master Plan. Is a role, is NLB's Lab 25 role is important, mission is important one of building a vibrant and dynamic learning marketplace for everyone. Just last year, President Halima Yaakob launched the Digital for Life or DFL movement to encourage a collective whole of nation effort to build a digitally inclusive society where all Singaporeans have the necessary digital tools, skills, and aptitude to succeed in the digital future. A key initiative of the DFL movement is the DFL Fund, which supports ground-up com community projects to achieve this vision. A number of such projects are already ongoing with partners such as RSVP, RSVP Singapore and Lions Prefender. These partners conduct programs that help seniors navigate the digital world safely including how they can protect their digital identity and how they can look out for online scams and harms. There is also help for caregivers who can tap on technology to aid in their caregiving and hopefully lighten their load. For instance, Lions Befriender, in partnership with IMDA, developed the IOK at LB tablet that allows staff and volunteers to check on seniors remotely to ensure that they are well. This month's Time of Your Life celebration, participants will, will be able to discover newer topics such as drone technology. This field of study looks at how technology can support seniors in living, working, and staying connected with society. So I look forward to hearing from some of the experts on this at the upcoming programs. As also mentioned by our earlier speakers, Mr. Ng Chiu Kong and Professor Chong, we must continue to use technology to improve the lives of our seniors. Later this month, the Tech Bazaar at Topayo will showcase new assistive, assistive technologies that will benefit older persons and their caregivers. I look, I look forward to see more of such technologies and I encourage all of you to check them out. There are so many other talks and workshops throughout the month covering other areas such as wellness, arts, sustainability, and careers. Participants will get to meet and engage peers as well as with English professionals and industry experts in gerontology. In conclusion, let me once again thank NLB and SUSS for this very meaningful collaboration for their hard work in putting together this meaningful series of programs. As all of you would be aware, Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong launched the Fourth Singapore Exercise a couple of months ago. The intent of this exercise is as Singapore emerges from COVID-19, is to bring society together, continue to remain united as one people, and as a timely opportunity for us to refresh our social compact, even as we progress as one people, one nation, especially in a much more dangerous, much more uncertain, and much more volatile world in the future. As part of this Forward Singapore exercise, we want to bring different stakeholders together, not just the government, but also community partners, civic society, individuals, experts, academia, coming together to look at the important issues confronting Singapore and how can each of us play a role to continue making Singapore vibrant, inclusive, and home for all for Singaporeans, including future generations. So in this spirit of Forward Singapore, I welcome all of your participation 
and look forward to hearing from various speakers and participants, including Professor Philip, Dr. Ng, and Associate, uh, Associate Professor Carol Mal, later on, on how we can collectively build a more inclusive society for all Singaporeans by working together. So thank you very much and wish all of you a meaningful time of life celebrations this month. Thank you. Thank you very much, SMS Tang Kiet Hao, for the inspiring address starting the time of your life celebration 2022. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move on to our keynote address for today. Uh, but just before we move there, I just want to remind all our guests about the Q&A function. So please feel free to submit your questions. If you have any questions for any of our speakers or for our keynote speaker as well, please do submit them. And the team will be actively answering the question. If not, we will pick it up during the Q&A session a bit later on. So for our keynote today, we are pleased to have with us Professor Ian Philp, founder of H Care Technologies or ACT. ACT won the 2021 United Nations WeSIS Prize for Innovation in Healthy Aging for their potential to add 100 million quality life years for older people and to reduce global cost of long-term care by $45 trillion. Professor Philp holds a doctorate in medicine from the University of Edinburgh and was a practicing physician for 35 years in the UK National Health Service, spending eight years as an executive medical director. As Professor of Healthcare for Older People at the University of Sheffield, he has led teams that have won the UK Hospital Team of the Year in the Care of Older People and the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Higher Education for Research into Improving the Quality of Life of Older People. From the year 2000 to 2008, he was the National Clinical Director for Older People in England, leading the development and implementation of the National Service Framework for Older People, campaigning to ensure respect for dignity in care and to eliminate age discrimination, leading national strategies for intermediate care, stroke, dementia, and the prevention of falls and fractures. Professor Philp was awarded a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2009 in recognition of his work to improve the lives of older people. He has also been an advisor to the World Health Organization in person centered care for older people. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Ian Philp for the keynote presentation. Professor, please. Thank you so much, uh, Lester. And um, it's, it's a real privilege to join this group and to follow on from the inspiring um, presentation from Senior Minister of State, Tan Kia Tao, uh, with the vision for Singapore to be an inclusive society, uh, embracing technology and ensuring connectedness. I am 100% sure that Singapore will be a beacon in the world around how to approach um, an aging society with policies and practices and innovations and systems which benefit the whole population. Um, and the themes that you, you mentioned, uh, Senior Minister, were I think also uh, represented in the earlier presentations from Professor Chong about connectedness and technology, uh, Mr. Ong about the importance of promoting active aging and um, represented in person by Miss Tan Yen Kim, um, showing how older people, um, all older people can contribute to their families, their societies, and, and uh, are not just passive recipients of care. Um, I want to bring the tone down to a more depressing topic, which is a recognition of the fact that with aging, come problems. Um, there are age-related declines in bodily functions, and there are threats that are posed from the social and physical environment that can reduce the quality of life of older people. And if we are to achieve the goals that are set out in the United Nations um, strategy for healthy aging 2020 to 2030, which is to optimize older people's functional independence so they are able to do the things which give their lives meaning and purpose. We have to recognize that we need to address the problems that many older people experience. Um, and my uh, presentation with you today is, is based on 
an understanding that the majority of threats that older people experience to their health, independence, and well being are underreported or reported too late. And to have an effective strategy for promoting healthy, active life so we could all expect to enjoy a life like the late Queen of England, living into our late 90s, working until our uh, last 24 hours on this planet, having a life of meaning and purpose and contribution, we need to ensure that we remove these threats, that we understand these threats and we address these threats. And I've spent um, the last 30 plus years now uh, leading an international project with many brilliant scientists, Carol Ma included, around the world to see how we could introduce systems that allow older people to report the threats to their health, independence, and well being, and to address these around the things which really matter to older people. And that's the key point here about the person centered approach. So I'm just going to share some slides with you. I want to talk about the person centered approach to preventive care for older people. And um, Lester, as you kind of mentioned in your uh, biography introduction to me, we were very privileged to win the inaugural United Nations Prize because we have a technology that's been developed over 30 plus years, tested in 50 countries um, with many publications, but also because I've introduced a social enterprise business model, we now have the technology to take this work to scale. And our ambition is that one in 14 all older people in the world will have access to this technology, irrespective of the ability to pay in low middle income and high income countries, so that their needs can be reported and their needs addressed. How does it help? Well, first for the older person, we know this technology starts with the things which matter most to older people. And in fact, when we engage with older people and ask them about what bothers them, although we can get a long list of problems, older people will usually say there is one thing right now that you could help me with. And thank you so much for asking, they'll <laughs> say. And then if we can help them with that one thing, these small things, and this is what working in old age practice teaches you, small interventions can make a big difference. Following the assessment, we give the older person a person-centered care plan, which records their concerns, it records the threats, it records the priorities for support, it records the actions that are taken, and it records the outcomes of these actions. And this plan can move with the older person as they move through the health and care system, so older people don't have to repeat again and again, the, the, the issues that they face every time they see somebody new. We know from the research that on average, uh, we add one extra quality life year per older person, and we compress morbidity by a year prior to death. So we're moving towards a frailty-free world where we extend healthy, active life, building resilience, well-being, independence, social connection, and healthy behaviors. And actually the social co connection pillar of the work is something which really evolved in our thinking in the years 2010 to 2018, partly informed by work done in Singapore uh, by the Sao Foundation and the National University of Singapore, of which um, uh, Wai Chong was, was part of that uh, team that did the work that showed how important social connection is for healthy aging. We also help the system because with one in four of the older population, of, of the whole population of Singapore by 2030 expected to be um, one, you know, one in four of the population above the age of 65. We know that we must have a system of care that is organized around the needs of older people as well as other age groups, not just an extension of models of care that work at earlier stages in life. So we have to importantly build and mobilize the community assets, the volunteer organizations, the communities, 
the contributions of technology, of housing, of transport, as well as health and care services. We need a policy that supports, as Minister, Senior Minister said, ageing in place, where most older people want to remain. We need policies that will reduce unnecessary acute admissions to hospitals uh, so that older people don't end up in a hospital bed, however beautiful they are, and I saw some beautiful hospital beds on my visits yesterday, the best place for older people is in their own homes. And we need a system that reduces the absolute cost of long-term care. And our uh, independent economic evaluation suggests really big lifetime savings through the compression of morbidity. And we need systems that generate equality of access and outcome, and we level up so that people who are left behind can experience the sort of uh, healthy aging um, lives that uh, the, the wealthiest can afford to give themselves. How does our technology work? We, although self-assessment is possible and as older people become more digitally aware, we have found that older people want to have a conversation with a person about their threats, the problems, their concerns, and add a discussion about what to do about it. So we, we train volunteers and we train contact centre staff to do telephone-based or face-to-face -face assessments with our technology, ident with older people, identifying the key concerns, their priorities, and then connecting them to local community assets, to information resources, identifying carers and connecting them to support, and also identifying risks that allow us to escalate care. We follow up, we track progress and outcomes, and we continue to provide cycles of assessment with older people for as long as they stay at home. And with the digital technology, we generate unique information about the needs and concerns of older people, what really matters to them. We deliver to older people um, access to older people and their carers to nationally curated information resources. And I, I welcome discussion with the National Library about what would be the best information resources to provide older people to help them with these 15 areas of concern. I've, I've grouped them into the 15 areas which are the World Health Organization domains under the ICOP program for bodily declines and key social and environmental factors. Vision, hearing, mobility, depression, cognition, loneliness, financial concerns, accommodation concerns, ability to, be, to participate, relationship problems, falls, nutrition, um, need for support and activities of daily living, urinary incontinence and oral health. These are the WHO recommended domains. So we curate these and make these available to older people. We also, under the World Health Organization framework, identify the risks associated with these domains. And we have a traffic light system and we agree local thresholds in the system where we need to escalate care. So where there are high risks, we can escalate to primary health care to do further primary care based assessments of these risks and follow the World Health Organization guidance to address these risks. We also identify older people who have very high needs for social care and support using a, a scale which uh, categorizes people into six levels. And we can use these thresholds to identify when older people need to have a formal assessment of their social care needs. And uh, using a technology such as the MDS InterI system or whatever systems are used locally for resource allocation, we can open the door to when that's required. But at the same time, provide a whole population offer for people that sit below the threshold of needing social care and support. And we generate four scores that we give the older person an index of their quality of life compared to others and compared with themselves to look at improvements in four dimensions, well-being, independence, 
social connection again, and staying healthy. And we can monitor improvements over time. So potentially everybody by removing concerns, we can optimize your wish profile and achieve 100 scores across the four domains. And we give the older person a personal care plan that can be shared with others involved in their care that summarizes on a couple of pages, the key outputs of the assessment. We're working now in, with 25 centers across 24 countries to validate this methodology. I had my research team working overnight on the early data and I've been looking at it and I, I hesitate to share the data about the needs with you before uh, I would be shot down by my academic colleagues. But let, let me just say that concerns like loneliness are very high on, on lists of concerns in many of these countries and also needs for support with activities of daily living. But I look forward to sharing with you a proper scientific evaluation of the results of these early studies. But what we do know from the work is that this technology can be a general offer to all older people living at home, and that the majority of older people will take up the offer when, uh, when, given, when offered to them. Um, but as well as a universal offer, we target support to more marginalized groups working with community leaders and voluntary sector organizations. We use non-professional assessors who we train, and this can help with building social capital through workforce development in the non-professional community. And we work through telephone or face-to-face -face assessment. We know we need to curate local, hyper-local lists of services, and we have a, a, um, a dynamic tool that, that local localities can continually update. Where is the best place to go for support if you want advice about your finances, for example? We would curate a national library of information resources, and I, would, I very much hope we can do that with NLB for Singapore. We agree with service leaders, the escalation pathway. So we don't overwhelm services, but when if we recognize something like a safeguarding concern, we know we should escalate for professional assessment. And we, because this is digital technology, it is actually relatively easy, even within information governance rules, to integrate the data into personal health and care electronic records and into population health management systems. We know that our technology identifies those people that need the WHO ICOP assessment. We know it identifies family carers who can be offered support. We know that it generates high satisfaction from older people and from the assessors involved in doing the assessments. They believe it makes a difference. And we know it generates valuable population insights. So here's a plan for Singapore. We would like to support the, the, the commitment to an aging and inclusive society and the refreshed action plan for seniors by offering a technology that could provide everyone 60 or 65 plus if we wish, a personalized preventive care plan. We can develop with an assessment partner, and I'm pleased to let you know that the likely assessment partner will be Lions Befrienders, to work with Lions Befrienders to undertake the assessment service. And we have a meeting on Tuesday to discuss how we could operationalize that and undertake some demonstration work. We know that the use of our tool can feed the WHO pathways and, and can help Singapore contribute to this World Health Organization. <clears throat> and we believe this could be a model for spread to the, to the ASEAN region with Singapore being the lighthouse for the spread of that model into other parts of the region. And I very much hope that I will have the opportunity to uh, work with many of you as we build the stakeholder relationships to create this connected approach to improving the lives of older people. And for your information, this is my contact uh, information here. Thank you very much for your time and interest. Thank you very much, Professor, for that wonderful keynote presentation.
Before I introduce Dr. Ng further, just a gentle reminder, if you'd like to ask any questions to Dr. Ng or Professor Philp uh, from our keynote earlier on, please do so via the Q&A platform because immediately after this, we'll be having a Q&A session. So back to Dr. Ng. So Dr. Ng Wai Chong is a practicing community aged care physician of over 20 years. His clinical and research interests include community aged care system development, primary health care for the frail, elder abuse, dementia care, case management, and end-of-life care and comprehensive needs assessment. Dr. Ng currently provides his expertise in various capacities, namely as health specialist at the Asian Development Bank, consultant for the Agency for Integrated Care, aged care expert in residence with the Lian Foundation, and medical advisor for the Home Nursing Foundation, as well as the Interi Fellow Singapore. He was the former Chief of Clinical Affairs of South Foundation and is still advising the Foundation as its Clinical Program Consultant. He's also a Research Fellow at the International Longevity Centre in Singapore. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Dr. Ng Wai Chong. Welcome Dr. Ng. Thank you Lester and thanks everybody and um, uh, congratulating, congratulations to Yin for an excellent presentation on the Aged Care Technologies platform. And uh, so uh, I would like to share some uh, ground up community development uh, projects that I had the privilege of uh, um, being involved in and learn a lot from it. So I'll be sharing some of my learning. So there was one of the um, participants who made, asked the questions around that. So that's my answer for you. Um, I understand among the audience, we have um, uh, members of the public, uh, members of the NLB uh, supporters, um, uh, some of you are retired, but I also understand we have many students from SUSS, particularly from the Masters of Gerontology program. Um, some of you are my students. So uh, my sharing is targeted at um, all of you. So pardon me if some of the part is a little bit full of jargons, uh, but I hope to convey it uh, sufficiently that it is meaningful for everyone. So let me just... Uh, I prepared a few uh, slides, a bit complicated, uh, but I'll do my best to explain it. <laughs> so it's from Komsa to Wosa, Integrated Care, One Community at a Time. My focus is on talking about the nuts and bolts of implementation uh, uh, to uh, complement uh, Professor Ian Phillips' um, uh, excellent uh, innovation in, in technology platform development, you know, for, for this um, care framework. So he mentioned about integrated care for the older person. It was an answer to WHO um, public framework, public health framework for healthy aging. So you can see from this very complicated chart, there's this red color and the blue color. So the red color um, is really talking about the fact that as we grow older, our physiological health will necessarily decline and that is something that is really um, difficult to control although there are lots of um, evidence now that through exercise and diet and and uh, stress management and good sleep and and um, learning and so on we can actually uh, um, but that requires a whole um, policy national effort in health education that's in the blue color part the blue color part are the external the, the environments, the community, the health services development that we can do to sort of keep people um, doing the things that they find meaningful. So that is the, the part about the blue part. You know, as we, our physiological health decline, our being able to do as we normally do and do things that are meaningful can still be supported if we design our care system well. But the problem is, how do you integrate this evidence-based practice with human behaviors in the community. And so um, the, 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 the challenge is really to really make it work despite the, the conceptual theoretical framework. So how do we make it work? And in 2019, um, I quote, Professor Phil talked about this a lot, integrated care for the older person was um, launched and um, publicized. But in this framework, it requires screening it requires person-centered assessment in primary care, in primary health care. And then there is a personalized care plan that you need to um, sort of uh, convey to the seniors so that they can take action on their own health. 
And you need to have a pathway and services in the community where um, uh, helps can be uh, received, you know, supported by the formal system as well as the informal system. Mm -hmm. And finally, we need to engage the whole community and all caregivers mm -hmm. to support people as they grow older and older, requiring more and more um, external help along the way. And in the implementation documents of this integrated care, um, one of the more uh, very important uh, undertaking is that you need to see whether the services, um, what kind of services models are needed to, um, to, to, to allow the implementation of this integrated care for the older persons. And in the handbook for ICOP, you can see that you need community-wide level of home-based interventions. Do you have home-based intervention in Singapore? So through the last nearly 20 years of work by Agency for Integrated Care, I would say that Singapore in this regard, we have done quite well. Person-centered assessments and integrated care plans, do we have that um, in place? Shared decision-making and goal-setting. Do our healthcare practitioners practice shared decision-making, goal-setting type of healthcare and social care? Are there sufficient support for self-management? Do people work as a team in a multidisciplinary team? And then are there um, free, uh, accessible uh, information and data for all of us to work as a team? And are there sufficient caregiver support? Because as a person grows older and frail, you need caregivers. If you do not support caregivers, you do not support the older person at all. Then formal links with social care and support services. And when we want to implement this, we need to have an, we need to first understand what kind of older persons we have in Singapore. We heard from uh, um, uh, SMS just now that Singapore is aging really fast. Um, just a few days ago, we are 18.4%. It was found 18.4% people are above the age of 65. And we're aging really fast. And but apart from this older age group, how many of them are in what extent are disabled? How much dementia do we have and then what kind of psychosocial issues we have in our community so this is an important um, uh, step even before we implement the ICO and the capacity of the services as well as the system to support this and the implementation plan so today um, as a as a um, uh, uh, as a dialogue I'd like to share some of the implementation models that I was involved in and then we can discuss it uh, moderated by Dr. Carol Ma. So, um, well, in 1.2014, even before the launch of the, uh, the, the uh, Healthy Aging Framework, um, in response to um, WHO age-friendly cities, yeah, so the Ministry of Health had this City for All Ages program, and at one pole, South Foundation was involved in the, in the designing of the implementation. So they had a few principles and approach. So we did population need survey, uh, using community volunteers, and we did a lot of neighborhood outreach. And uh, through that way, uh, I must say that we, I must give credit to Ian, we used um, Easy Care, which was developed by Ian at that time for this community survey. And then um, identify people who are vulnerables, vulnerable, and then we, we support them with primary care integrated with community-based long-term care. And the focus was on growth on resilience and not focus on the diseases, but it's like everybody lives with some imperfections here and there, but all of us, you know, we strive for growth. So this was an important principle in the development of COMSA. And uh, the model of health has necessarily be biopsychosocial in nature because people do not live in hospitals or nursing homes. People live at home, just like all of us do. And then you need to build a sustainable ecosystem whereby, because taking care of um, the frail require resources, but of course, if you don't take care of the frail, the resources requirement is even more. So how do we make it in such a way that you get the best value for, for the investment resources? So these are all quite um, uh, challenging. Um, there's another model that was developed, but it's initiated by the hospital. You can see here uh, on the screen, you have the director of uh, Allied Health and Com Ops, uh, as well as the CEO of Ndingfong Hospital. So at that time, they wanted to do a project to improve and uh, uh, identifying people who are frail and then screen for um, uh, those who are frail and then intervene with uh, 
integrate health and social care. And uh, so uh, this was, as you can see, the, the MP, uh, Mr. Murali is also there. This is a graduation ceremony because the GPs led by um, Dr. Kwek Tiam Su here, he was, the, he was one of the GPs in the primary care network in Bukit Batok. And he felt that GPs really need to rise up to the challenge to support the frail. And then together with um, Ding Fong Hospital, they started a training program for the GPs. And Ding Fong Hospital has a way to of community surveys, identifying people who are, who are frail, connect them with the um, community services. So this is uh, quite a successful example of GP engagement. This is another example. It is in response to the East Coast Civil Blueprint. Um, SMS was uh, one of the MPs in East Coast GRC, as we all know. Um, and in, uh, um, in, in this particular area, the MP, Ms. Cheryl Chan, took a lead um, together with the grassroots uh, leaders, executed a whole game plan, you know, um, organizing the volunteers, organizing community services, involving the People's Association. And then together, they have this um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, group sessions. Um, and then the grassroots leader were in the planning. Um, instead of using the commissary screener that uh, like Ting Fong Hospital and, and South Foundation used, um, uh, in this uh, platform, we used the community risk screener developed by AIC, Agency for Integrated Care. So the Agency for Integrated Care has been working on integrated care for the older person since its beginning. And uh, this instrument was quite useful because it aligns with the community network of seniors, the CNS model, where you identify people who are active aging, who needs befriender or budding, and those who are more frail, you will need some kind of care assessment. That's where Ian talked about, you know, identifying people who are really frail, you need more professional, more in-depth assessment. So this um, CST sort of did that quite well. And uh, once you found them to be really frail, um, the community care partners, in particular, Peace Haven uh, Nursing Home has a branch in uh, Fengshan area and they provided the, the, the care management support and then linking them with the uh, community services. So this is uh, something that I took off the Facebook page of uh, Michelle Chan. So this was a kind of a, um, a, a, a appreciation ceremony for our volunteers who knock on doors to identify people who are at risk. This is another very interesting model that uh, uh, um, using the same kind of understanding, uh, basically screening, comprehensive assessment, linking primary care, um, is applied in Indonesia. So the government understood about the aging issues in Indonesia, although it's still a very young country, it's a giant of a country in our region, but it's still quite young, supported by Asian Development Bank. So they have this similar framework where you can, um, they, they have a technology platform called the Silani. Um, and their screening tools is a composite of different kinds of tools to identify people who are at risk. Mobilizing the cadres, cadres are like the volunteers, the Posendu Lansias are the health stations in the villages. So they would, they would do a kind of a carpet bomb sweep of all seniors living in Jakarta, Bali, and then uh, and of course, not the whole Bali or Jakarta because it's, it's, they done for the whole Jakarta, but our project was more localized to a few districts. So the, the cadres will screen and then, um, and then the, um, we created an algorithm to identify people at level one, two, and three. So this stratification is very important. Otherwise, you may not have enough capacity to support everybody. So you need to identify those who are highest risk uh, moderate risk and lowest risk. The highest risk, of course, you need more resources. So um, for those who are um, lower risk, we um, the, the community sort of built a kind of a, a place where people can gather. They are volunteers, you know, you screen and then they are really quite well, active ager, they come to the community care hub and then be volunteers for the other seniors as well as engage in uh, different kinds of exercises, recreation uh, um, uh, and, and other activities. I, rec I, I noticed when I was visiting that they do some income generator thing event, um, activities like rearing the, the, the tilapias, the lipunhu, 
for for money, you know. So the seniors sort of help themselves with different kinds of um, activities. But the level three, who are really the more complex one, um, you need to train care managers. This is new. There, there aren't care managers, but you need to... Um, actually, there are from the Puskesmas, which is like the polyclinic. But, um, so we sort of uh, improve on the training. Uh, there are more psychosocial dimension, more ADL support, and some of the critical um, aged care common issues that we need to consider. So these were part of the training programs. And they work closely with the polyclinic equivalent, the Puskesma. So you can see there's integration of primary care and psychosocial support. And then there's a weekly meeting. And then you have to involve the other departments like the social workers and other NGOs, BKL, LKS, um, to, to develop this. So this is some of the um, uh, uh, pictures of our training program. It's all done during this pandemic period. So it's quite interesting. When we do the assessment, it's like using GoPro and... And then we have uh, um, a lot of case studies. So in summary, the four programs, the first one was initiated by a social service agency, the South Foundation. So the community survey was done by volunteers. The risk screening tool was Comsa BPS Risk Screener, which is 50% um, Easy Care, 50% um, Social Health School and South Foundation. We sort of, um, based on our study, we found that these are quite important for biopsychosocial risk. Two levels. Higher level, you need to have more comprehensive assessment. We use Interi HC. And then um, and then there's care management and primary care integrated. And you need the other community partners like the regional health system, other senior social agencies, as well as the grassroots. Uh, uh, SMS Heng Chi Hao was um, also uh, deeply involved in this project. And Bukit Batok uh, IDG, they call it IDG, uh, was initiated by the hospital because of the need to identify frailty and prevent it. They also use COMSA risk screener, two levels, comprehensive assessment using interact checkup. The social department provide the case management. The primary care was the PCN network, the GPs. Uh, and then, uh, of course, all other part community partners like Ciji and Andrews, Fei Yue, they were also heavily involved. And the East Coast Civil Blueprint, it was initiated by the MP. And then the community survey was done by grassroots volunteers. The risk screener was using Agency for Integrated Care Community Screening Tool, identifying three le levels of ABC. Interact checkup, Peace Haven was the case management, and then we use whatever is available primary care resources there are, and then there are also uh, various community partners. In Indonesia, the, um, the community survey was conducted through the Silani using the community um, health stations and volunteers, the, uh, as well as the polyclinic, the Puskesmas. Um, the screening tool is Silani, three levels. The assessment instrument was something that we developed that is user-friendly to locals and also identify common issues there. The active aging hub, which was new as a case management. Primary care was the Puskesmas integrated with the case management and the health station. So my final few slides, personal reflection. You need inspired leadership and risk takers to do this. Primary care integration with frail care is challenging because it is not easy working as a team. No psychosocial care means no care. Who needs care management is not a simple question. Community will congregate. We just need a meaningful platform and the right kind of leaders. Health and care capacity is a limiting factor in our region. Um, I'm referring to our Southeast Asia. Singapore is, is a urban, very urban and relatively uh, well-resourced country. So it's a different ball game, but when you go to the region, um, uh, the formal supports is actually limited, but the volunteer network is really strong, but not all. Knowledge, attitude, practice, related training is key. Most people we study the technical, but when it comes to KAP, we are like, oh, this is humanity subject, I'm not interested. IT integration and right financing were critical because all this would drive the behavior of the players. Right research method and right timing is fair evaluation. If you do a wrong research, you may feel that uh, you may not you may identify a gem as rubbish or a rubbish as a gem. So I'd like to pay tribute to uh, Dr. Marianne Sao, who started the Comsa. She's recently awarded uh, the the UN Healthy Aging 50 because of her work in integrated care. So that's Comsa that I presented just now. So thank you very much for your time. 
All right, thank you very much, Dr. Ng, for the wonderful presentation. So can I please invite you to remain uh, because we will be moving on to the Q&A segment now. Uh, so I'd also like to invite Professor Ian Philp uh, back to join us uh, to answer questions. This Q&A session will be moderated by Associate Professor Carol Ma, Head of Gerontology Programs at the Singapore University of Social Sciences, Singapore. Associate Professor Carol Ma is known within academia and the community as an active and passionate practitioner of service learning and aging issues in Asia. She's the senior fellow of the Center for Experiential Learning and head of gerontology programs, master's and PhD at the Singapore University of Social Sciences. And I'll now hand the time over to our moderator, Associate Prof. Carol Ma. Thank you, Lester. So um, thank you, Ian and Wai Chon, to give a very good um, presentation. And thanks, Ian, to share with us how ACT can be used in supporting the preventive care. And Wai Chon, thank you very much also because you have been talking a lot of, uh, you know, different models yeah, and assessment in various countries. I'm sure that we have a lot that we can learn from you. And one thing that I totally agree with you that we need inspired leadership, yeah, especially if we want to promote quality of care care in Singapore. So um, actually, I saw a few questions uh, in the Q&A chat. Yeah, uh, maybe I start with Ian. Is that okay? So I actually saw a question actually mentioned about how does ACT solution complement or duplicate what Singapore has been doing since the setup of the AIC or other organizations like South. I think Ian, uh, you also get a chance to visit the hospital and also met some of the staff from Agency for Integrated Care. So maybe you can also share with us about your view. Thank you. Well, and thank you for the questions um, that I saw in the, the Q&A box. Um, I, I believe that aged care technologies complement the fantastic work done by uh, South Foundation, by Wai Chong and others in Singapore, the work of the Agency of Integra for Integrated Care by starting with a person-centered assessment to help older people report what really matters to them and connect them to support. I believe then we need to go through screening stages um, using uh, the sort of screeners that Wai Chong uh, was referring to, to identify the levels of intervention that are needed leading up to comprehensive uh, assessments with the interripe, which is being used here uh, extensively and to good purpose. So I, I think ACT, Assess and Connect, sits just one stage ahead as a population offer that generates support for the population, which then in turn goes through the pathways so we can escalate care and use resources, always there'll be limited resources to best effect. So I, I think there's a really good fit and um, Wai Chung, you and I are going to meet later. We can explore that a bit further when we meet. I don't know what your thoughts are, uh, Wai Chung, about that. Wai Chung, yeah. yeah. Um, totally agree. Actually, um, uh, we can't do comprehensive assessments like we did, like using whether Interi or any other instruments for everyone that you see on the streets. It's just not practical, mm -hmm. but uh, for those people who are frail, you need relatively detailed assessment in order to have care plans that are really meaningful and make a difference to the person. And you cannot be too superficial about that too. Um, so there has there's a role for some kind of case finding, risk identification, and those who are low risk, you also need to have care plans, but those should be um, health promotion, disease prevention, and, and early like intrinsic capacity deficits, you know, that you, you described too. And you need to have um, interventions that is um, perhaps more informal, more community, uh, a resource, uh, 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 easily accessible resources for that. And you don't really want compli complicated assessment for people who are like only mildly frail or not frail at all. So um, there is definitely a place for... Um, uh, something like ACT, you know, to uh, to identify people who are mildly at risk and link them to the necessary services. Yeah, and I, I agree that uh, other than that, we also need to think of the purpose of using different assessment or tool, right? So yeah. uh, because there are lots of tools that, uh, you know, um, can be used not only in Singapore, even in other places. It's a matter of we have to go back to the questions, why we want to use it. 
and how this actually linked to our quality of care. So um, actually, I also want to follow up because I have another question related to ACT. So that's why I also want to, uh, you know, um, follow up to ask these questions, Ian. So has the ACT project uh, mentioned by Professor Phil started in Singapore? How could one participate or indicate interest? Yeah. So Ian, maybe you can further, because you mentioned about we will work with Blind Defender, right? So maybe you can actually uh, mention about that. Yeah, answer this question. Thank you, uh, Carol. Um, my reply to that question is that anyone interested in getting involved should contact you, Professor Carol, because you will be leading the project with your fantastic team and uh, we'll be supporting with the provision of our technology and and how. I, I will become your agent again. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So because uh, we are also working together with Ian, so for those who are interested, then you can also contact me or maybe you can go to ACT website and take a look on uh, what is ACT. Yeah, and so other than ACT, right, I think there are some practical questions and I like this question. It's about are there any successful grant up initiative that you could share? So I think to both Ian and also Wai Chong, because uh, Wai Chong, you talk about different model, right? But I, I also want to learn more about the content. Yeah, even though I know you very well and also know about uh, you know, the project, but I think it will be good that for the audience here to understand more about the content and its successful uh, ground up initiative. And Ian, you mentioned about a lot of countries also involved in ACT, right? So um, can you also share one uh, successful initiative to us? Yeah, maybe uh, Wai Chong first. Okay, um, I would say I... To, to call anything a success is really a tall order. Um, from my experience, everything is work in progress. Every year, there are new challenges you need to face because of technology and innovations and different ways of skinning the cat, you know, different kinds of policies. And, uh, there's, and on top of that, you have the pandemic to deal with in the last two years. And um, it's all around, even in uh, communities in Indonesia, there is also turnover of staff. But you can see things certainly gradually start to stick shape. As we develop further, people start to realize that primary care, you can no longer just deal with acute um, uh, issues like knee pain and coughs and colds and so on. More and more, we need to work as a team. The primary care gradually, as you can see all the different models, people start to realize that you need to work with community workers um, to translate your care plan into something meaningful to them. It could be nurses, but you also need some kind of social work competencies to do that, as well as emotional well-being uh, practitioners. I mean, you can call them counselors or just very well-trained volunteers. So you start to see that. And also you start to see that medicine and health is cannot function alone, especially with the aging population. You need to work with technologies. You need to work with businesses. Uh, you need to uh, work with uh, community organizers. And you also start to see what is evidence, what is research. And then the different kinds of research, um, sometimes you, you on the ground, you know this run really works, but the way you do the research doesn't demonstrate it. And so... Uh, um, yeah, so there are many things to learn, even though Komsa is now like nearly 10 years and um, the other communities are only beginning, you can start to see everybody build on other people's um, sort of knowledge and, and, and learning. So what is success? Success, I think, is just getting on and doing it and people always have a sense of hope that is success. Mm, and then also we keep learning, right? Because we learn yeah. from, you know, what we actually made a mistake or yes. maybe we learn from how we actually work together because, uh, you know, talking about grown up initiative could not be just uh, one stakeholders. Yeah, yes. we need to have a collective action, uh, effort to work together. So how about Ian? Can you share with us about uh, any grown up initiative? Well, um, thank you. Um, I would recognise, the first of all, the work and the development of the COMSA and its use. I think that was a fantastic initiative. Um, the, the other one, and we awarded a prize through our ACT International Network to the developers of that approach, recognising the quality. The, the other prize we awarded uh, um, uh, in the memory of, of a man called Jack Waters, who was a fantastic um, individual who sponsored lots of great work for older people and died young, sadly, of um, bladder cancer. We, we awarded to... Um, 
a group in Uganda, uh, a charity um, called Health Nest Uganda, who took the the what was then called the Easy Care technology and developed national training programs in its use and equipped community volunteers with the tool. Um, and now that is used as a national system in Uganda for people to address the unmet needs of older people living at home. And if anyone wants to see the impact, you can go on YouTube and just type in Health Nest Uganda Easy Care, and you'll see the impact that had on one older person's life who comes out of a little hut, meets a group of people who've been trained with the method. They do various nice things with her, like washing her feet and so on. And she comes out very hunched and then she walks back upright with poise and dignity and uh, it summarizes how the use of the tool with trained volunteers improved seven or eight aspects of her life and she was 103 years old. Oh yeah amazing so actually it seems that you know when we conduct training or when we introduce any new uh, technology assessment then uh, it would be good that we can also consider how we can institutionalize or make it as you know you know a uh, national or maybe you know a local policy so that's why everyone can also uh, participate so actually both of you also mentioned about using technology yeah, and uh, one of our uh, participants here actually mentioned about that. Actually, not many older person they are tech, uh, you know, digitally uh, savvy. Yeah, and then so um, how actually we can support this group? Because uh, her question actually is about are we also marginalized this group of Singaporean? So what what will be your views? Because you two keep talking about tech, use of technology also, but I think uh, we have to admit that some group of the people they have really uh no idea how to use technology. So what would be your advice? Ian? <laughs> okay, well, um, I, I had a look at the question and um, one of the things we do in the Act Assess and Connect is we ask the older person, have they con got concerns about using modern communication technologies and would they like some help? So we can, if, if that is a concern of an older person, we can direct them to people locally that can provide that advice or the training or whatever. Um, and we'll also get data when we've conducted our studies around the world to see what is the prevalence of that concern, um, because um, it, it's wrong to believe that most older people are not digital communication savvy. Most are, um, but some are not. So we have to help those who are not. The, the other thing is we found that although older people might be able to use self-assessment technologies and so on, they prefer to speak to somebody. Um, and having that conversation with somebody, a peer volunteer or a care worker, somebody who's been trained in speaking with older people, is the therapeutic part of the intervention as much as any services that we can mobilize for the person. So um, the digital element, which I think works, is to avoid lots of duplication in the system. So once information has been collected, once it can be shared, once information has been collected, it can be extracted. We can start to use AI to look at the clusters of patterns of needs. We can inform policy and decision-making around how we extract data about the real needs of older people. So I think technology has a huge amount to play and our, our prize is from, the WISIS prize is, is sponsored by six UN agencies, World Health Organization, but also the International Telecommunications Union who are committed to driving up the uptake of communication technologies for the benefit of older people. Mm. So, I mean, for me, uh, when we think of technology, we always visualize, say, a senior talking to a robot. It doesn't have to be like that. I mean, like when we were doing our project in Jakarta, in Bali, I didn't travel at all. You know, it's, everything is on Zoom. I was able to understand how they designed the, the Puskesmas, the polyclinic, you know, the, um, there are two stories, there's no car park and then uh, the counter and, and how it was it like. So I was able to use um, video to do appraisal, needs assessment, gap analysis. And then throughout the last two years, Every Wednesday, we are just online. And then the community volunteers, through the translation function of Zoom, was able to receive training from myself and a consultant from Canada. And then we were able to um, do case studies together. 
And then on top of that, in Singapore, we benefited from the National Electronic Health Record. For a long time as a GP, I, I had no way of getting um, the hospital, uh, you know, what have they done, unless the family insists on a, a discharge summary. But even then, the discharge summary is not very complete. But now with the electronic health record system that we have in Singapore, we could, um, we could access it. And there's this continuation, and I really have to thank technology for it. As for um, assessment, I think you saw the Indonesian Silani system. The, the Singapore, we didn't use technology base for the screener, but we use it for the assessment. The interact assessment is best um, used on the, uh, the, the, the tech platform because it can really produce the, the care issues as well as the various measurements of the risk and strength of a person and can sort of support decision-making for you. And that's all technology. And, uh, and seniors, when nowadays we chat with each other on WhatsApp and talk to each other on smartphone, that is also technology too. So technology has been working closely with health and social care. It's just that we, it's, it's so, it's everywhere that it's ubiquitous that we, we it's invisible now. <laughs> yeah, but, but Wai Chong, I want to follow up, but how actually we can help the elderly? Because even though, uh, you know, we understand they still have older adults, they find it difficult to use technology, even WhatsApp or smartphone, yeah. right? Yeah, and um, so during the pandemic, actually we have a number of elderly, they also learn how to use Zoom. Yeah, yeah, it's good that we have actually uh, some elderly here. I noticed that you put on the message and said that you are over 70 years old. You join our, our, our seminar and really welcome you. Yeah, and so but we, we, how we can encourage more elderly. Yeah, yeah so this um, community-wide training is definitely very important, especially you yeah, that identify a few um, very critical uh, media, you know, like the use of smartphone, the use of WhatsApp. How do you... Um, use uh, Facebook or even TikTok as well as how to use Zoom. So you need someone to do the training. But beyond that, I feel, um, because from my own experience, I have been, uh, um, I, I've known there are many innovations related to aged care technologies, but you need quite a lot of customization, but you also need quite a lot of curation Quite a lot of person-centered prescription. So if you want to use the, the higher levels and more specific kind of technologies, we may need to build it into our comprehensive assessment system, you know, identifying the clinical issues, the social issues, the emotional issues, the functional issues. On top of that, your interventions, you need to consider what are the technology available. I feel we need um, expertise, develop type of occupational therapies or maybe some other kind of uh, um, professionals are required to, to, to bridge this gap. I, I think the most important is we have to understand about uh, what are their needs. Yeah, and yes, why... Yes. Uh, it has to be individualized. Older, yeah. yeah, and individualized. And also we have to understand why older person, um, they actually cannot use technology. Yeah, and then we understand about the barriers, the challenges. Yeah, and then we have to, you know, address it. Yeah, with proper solution or maybe training for them. So I, because both of you are medical doctor, I have a question here. I think also focus on health and social care integrated. Yeah, maybe you two can actually answer it because I, I see it's very important if we promote health and social care integration. So the question is, may we know what if there are platform for the primary care GP to communicate with social care organization? to track the care plan for older adults. Any platform that you guys know, yeah, in the world, that uh, actually can track, you know, um, you know, the care plan for the older adults. Because we keep talking about, right, health and social integration. We talk about PP, PCC. We talk about, okay, after, uh, you know, um, patient discharge from the hospital, then what, what are actually the care plan for the elderly? So, yeah, can you actually share with us some of your views? Yeah, well, <laughs> the technology is not the problem here. The, the problem is interorganizational agreement. So there has once there is an interorganizational agreement to share information and under what circumstances, with what consent procedures, what levels of information are shared, then technologists can build the can use the APIs to connect the data safely and securely to transfer with a person through their system. Um, 
So uh, people think it's all about, well, do you use system one or whatever? <laughs> um, is the system that a primary care group might be using or a social services are using. If they're using systems which forbid transfer of information to other systems, we shouldn't be using these systems because that is only promoting single organizational um, dominance rather than a, a person-centered approach where information should follow an individual with their consent to others that may be involved in their care. And so part of our uh, local adaptation of the Access and Connect tool into local systems is to create these organizational agreements about what can be shared and our engineers then build the interfaces so the information can be shared. Yeah, I, I actually want to also highlight one thing. Uh, maybe you all don't know. Actually, Professor Ian Thiel also was the director of National Clinical uh, you know, Center for the uh, Integrated uh, Care for the Older Person. So, uh, Ian, can you actually share with us whether UK have this system or not? The, which system? The, the system that can connect to the social care organization. Um, it, it happens in some parts of the UK and not in others because there may or may not be the arrangements. There, there are significant work was done in Scotland to create a shared in electronic uh, integrated care record. So they have that pretty well established in Scotland. In England, uh, after a period where there was a disaggregation of the health and social care system, there's been a, an increasing belief in the value of integration and now this is formally expressed with the establishment of integrated care boards which require um, the health the social sector and the voluntary sector to work together for the health of the population and as a result of that moves are being made to integrate in information systems I mean I was pleased to see yesterday the establishment of the three regional um, healthcare groups with the opportunity there also to integrate the contributions of the different stakeholders to the care of the people that are looked after in in the three parts of Singapore through the public health system that 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 will provide a structural framework around which better information sharing can be developed in, in my opinion okay thank well, you Ian and have over Cho so if you want to see a model where primary care and social care are well integrated you can go to Comsa at the Wampo Community Club the Huame Clinic at Komsa have practiced the patient-centered medical home. And when we designed it, the idea is primary care, age-friendly, integrated with case management. That is health and social integration. That is patient-centered medical home. The other one you can look at was the Ng Fong model that I shared just now. Because of the tremendous leadership and passion by the primary care network, particularly the leadership there, he participated regularly in the interdisciplinary group meeting that occurs once every two months. The social worker will share with everybody who are the high-risk cases. The GPs are sitting there. There is an a and &E doctor, and they're mostly community service agencies. And then sometimes some of the medical issues are concerned and discussed. The doctors will contribute. Sometimes they'll say that I can see him in my clinic. Then they'll just connect this way. Sometimes doctors can see some cases with very complicated psychosocial issues, raise it at the IDG platform, and somebody else will say, oh, I provide home care, let me just take over that. So this IDG, the interdisciplinary group practice, is very important key. I mean, even in the um, uh, models that you see in uh, uh, the SPICE program, now it's called the I IHDC program, you have health and social integration. And uh, the, the magic, uh, the secret sauce, it's actually these interdisciplinary group sessions. Sometimes it can happen on, on, on chat groups. So, of course, you still need that formal channel that Ian talked about, that um, the inter-organizational agreement whereby there is a sharing of resources. But those facts and data uh, are important, but that personal discussion is even more important. Mm, yeah, I totally agree. So this session is actually about uh, improving aged care for the community. So my last questions to you both, can you share with us the major tips on how we should enhance the aged care for the community? Wai Chong, you want to go first? <laughs> Big question. Um, I feel... Uh, um, everybody need to... that You need a total awareness, you know, that aging is as real as climate change, but it's not, maybe not as 
uh, um, I mean, it, it is very close, you know, it's very, very, it's almost touching the skin, this uh, um, aging issues, and you need to, everybody needs to come on board, and then participate actively in the community as volunteers, but of course, you also need the structure and framework, and, and in Singapore, we have like, um, the stars are really aligning now, there's this emphasis on healthy SG, where primary care is now a uh, uh, front and center, you know, really, really important. And then you have regional health system organizing themselves, creating some kind of financing methodology that will conduce towards prevention and health promotion as well as person-centeredness. And then, uh, um, and, and of course, uh, all the community resources coming together, working as a team. So it's, it's, it sounds really easy, but it's really very hard. It's really about how do you make everybody coming together, aligning the IT, the finance, their training and training is not just the technical training. I mentioned about attitudes, about mindset. That is really the hardest part to train. So the doctors need to think beyond just medicine. The social work need to think beyond just about financial resources. Need to go into the intrinsic uh, resilience of the person. You know how what motivates them, what manage the stress. And caregivers need to be supported. It's not you cannot take for granted that family should take care of family. Of course they should, but mm. we cannot take this for granted. So all these need to sort of come together. So, well, it's a tough question. I can do my best. Yeah. <laughs> we need to develop, um, you know, more empathy to understand about what others are doing and how we can work together, right? Yeah, yeah, you should do more, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we co-create together. Yeah, how about Ian? Well, I, I would go to the United Nations a Plan for the Decade on Healthy Aging, and there are four pillars. Yeah, yeah. Um, one is to tackle age discrimination. Yeah. Uh, a second is to build age-friendly environments. Um, a third is to develop workforce capacity to care for older people. And the fourth is to develop person-centered and integrated approaches mm -hmm. to health and care. And, and that's where particularly I'm working um, to contribute to the, that fourth pillar. But they, you know, they're they're interdependent. Well, we've got a society that regards older people as beneath um, in terms of access to health and care. Um, um, that's wrong. I, I see that less in a society like Singapore, where older people are valued uh, members of families and community. I see that less here. I, I think there is a workforce challenge here. Can we continue to rely on an immigrant workforce to substitute for family care when it's needed? Um, and um, huge demand for um, care workers to work in the healthcare of older people in their rehabilitation and, and so on. Um, but again, I don't think we're embracing the whole population support, including older people themselves that can contribute to peer support. Um, I, and I, I think on the age-friendly environment, Singapore is doing great work. It, 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 Singapore and, and Carol, you're contributing to that with your research team, looking at creating age-friendly communities and an age-friendly city-state. And then for the person-centered integrated care approach, I, I think the challenge is that there are so many initiatives now mm. that need to somehow be brought together into a plan that will deliver the, the, the outcomes and it, if the space is too crowded aged care technologies will withdraw and leave it to, to others to, to continue the work in the area but if we can contribute something we'd be very happy to. Yeah thank you Ian and Wai Chong I think uh, you know if we want to enhance the community care for the community I think there's a lot of things that we need to do we need everyone's effort here yeah and so SUSS and NLB yeah and why we work together is also we want to raise more awareness and public awareness is very important and then we keep actually also talking about we need to voice out what we need right and then also as a family member policy maker academia we also need to listen what the elderly want and rather than you know think of what we, what we think they they want yeah and I remember that I have a project working with NLB also yeah one of the um you know uh, caregiver yeah and as a caregiver of the, the person living with dementia and she mentioned about that sometimes we forget uh, what other what they forget so it just actually remind us also yeah and sometimes we may think that uh, what they need but may not be what they need yeah so we need to actually um you know, really have this platform and then listen to each others and work together to build a, you know, age-friendly community. So thank you very much, Ian and Wai Chong. Yeah, thank you to join us this session. Thank you.
So for those who are interested uh, in studying gerontology program, so I just want to let you know, yeah, and SQSS, we also offer uh, different kind of program and courses. Yeah, so if you are interested, then you can go to this uh, website. Yeah, and we have a lot of uh, YouTube channel also. Yeah, and if you want to learn about um, different topic, you can also go to our uh, SQSS Gerontology YouTube channel. Yeah, if you want to know about the latest development of the program, you can also go to our uh, Facebook here. Then uh, you can also notice, uh, you know, the latest program development, including recently we actually developed minor in applied aging studies. Yeah, for those who actually want to taste uh, or try to understand more about the aging, you can also come to enroll our uh, minor in applied uh, aging study. So if you look at uh, our program, it's a stackable approach. Yeah, and so you can study from minor, graduate certificate, graduate diploma, master, or even PhD in gerontology. So why we are here? We are here is we need to create a workforce that they can also address uh, aging issues together. So um, thank you very much for your time to join our first session. And we have a lot of sessions in the coming uh, you know, weeks. Yeah, and hopefully I can see you again. So I will pass the time to Lester. Thank you, Lester. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Carol Ma. Uh, so as you see from this slide on your screen in front of you, uh, you know, a, a lot of you are very passionate about this field. That's why you're here as well. So you know, if you're interested to upgrade yourselves, uh, please feel free to check out some of these programs that you see on the screen by SUSS. Uh, but I got to say, what, what a fantastic uh, Q&A session. Uh, you know, clearly experts in their field, very passionate about the topic. And also a big thank you to all of you for submitting your questions as well. Uh, you know, of course, the team will be continuing to have conversations with all of you. Uh, but I want to say a big thank you to uh, Professor Philip, Dr. Ng, and uh, Associate Professor Carol Ma for the wonderful Q&A segment. Now, also, uh, earlier on, I, I noticed in the Q&A as well, a lot of you are asking about some of the resources that are actually available. Uh, so over here, I'd like to now uh, bring online here uh, NLB's librarian, Purdy Ma, uh, to share with all of you some of the resources available to all of you to tap on. So, Purdy? Thanks, Lester. Um, hi, I'm Purdy, a librarian with the Seniors Programs team at NLB. And as you mentioned, I will be taking you through some resources that have been put together for the Time Here Life celebration this year. So first up, um, I'd like to show you how to access these resources on your own. Um, we have created a one-stop resource page where you can find all our resources in one link. So if you scan the QR code that you see on the screen or use the web link that will appear in the chat panel, you will see the web page that is shown on the right. And this will take you to all our different resources. So, okay, on to the next slide. So what is a library event without book recommendations, right? So um, here we have three books that tie in really nicely, I think, with what has been shared today. Um, first uh, book on the left is Aging with Dignity. Um, this is a book that covers the findings of a 10-year study in Singapore on activities for seniors that promote healthy aging and slowing down dementia. Um, and some of the issues they cover would be mindfulness, diet, language, and memory. And just to pull out as an example chapter, uh, one of them looks at the connection between choral singing and cognitive health. So that's one of the things that you can expect to be reading about. So um, this book is co-edited by Prof uh, Kwa Yishok, who's well known in the field for his work on aging and mental health. And um, the second book, uh, we have been talking a lot about aging in place and community support. So uh, one aspect uh, which has been mentioned is age-friendly environments. And this book looks at age, aging-friendly neighborhoods. And uh, some of the topics that they cover, I mean, this is basically a book about uh, that looks at practice, um, policy, and research in Singapore, Asia Pacific, Europe, and North America. And it's broken up into categories like transport, housing, respect, and social inclusion, and employment. And um, this is uh, these are initiatives by the government and different agencies um, in Singapore and other places. So um, uh, one thing to say for these two books that is that even though they are research and policy-related books, I assure you that uh, they are very readable. I've looked at them and you don't have to be an academic to appreciate them. Um, also, the good thing is that they have been published very recently. So Aging with Dignity was just published this year and Aging Friendly Neighborhoods in 2020. So together, um, these two books will give you a very good overview of the frameworks and interventions that support aging well in Singapore and other places. And uh, the third book uh, on the right, um, this book uh, is a special book because I put it in because it will already give you like a real and personal face 
to the struggles of seniors as well as the families who look after them. So this is a memoir by a local author, Danielle Lim, and she won the Singapore Lit Prize for this book. Um, among the characters is her uncle who had schizophrenia and her grandmother who committed suicide to lessen the burden to the family. So basically this book depicts the struggles faced by the main caregiver, the author's mother, in keeping everything together for the family. And um, it is set in uh, Singapore during the 60s and 90s. So actually, when you read this book, you will get a sense of how the social supports and medical care have actually improved drastically since that time. And um, But the thing is that we realize that uh, these issues of mental health and elder suicide, they're all issues that continue to remain with us and they're valid. So from reading this book, which is a very moving read, you will get a better understanding of why we need all the community support that the speakers have been talking about for vulnerable seniors, as well as the families who look after them. So um, on the next slide, I'd just like to introduce you to this resource that uh, we have in NLB. It's an online learning platform offered free by NLB where you can learn at your own pace. And you can find up to 13,000 courses here. And it's not just on business, but personal development topics such as communication, mind mapping, and even things like how not to procrastinate. Uh, you can even get enrichment courses like art history. So to get started on this, all you need is a valid My Library username. And uh, to the next slide, uh, we have also put together a resource list that looks at different aspects of self-care um, in the physical, mental, and emotional aspects. And by looking after our own well-being, we can better handle the challenges that we face in life. And this is especially true for caregivers. So this is something that they have put together. Um, and in my final slide, um, this is basically just a reminder that you can find all our recommended resources at this link. And um, besides what I had mentioned, uh, this also links to the NLB mobile app, which if you don't have yet, this is a handy app that will allow you to borrow uh, ebooks and uh, resources from the library at the, on the convenience of your hand on your mobile phone. And uh, this, also, this link also allows you to sign up to our mailing list, uh, Time of Your Life mailing list, as well as more programs that we have in store for you. And uh, yeah, you can also read our Time of Your Life magazine, which is specially uh, written by librarians for seniors. And if after um, attending all the events in this year's Time of Your Life celebration, you're interested to find out what we've been doing in the past two editions, you can also do so through this link. Yeah, so uh, I'm done with my slides and thanks, uh, Lester. I'm handing the time back to you.